I find it very interesting that sometimes people in business are afraid to talk about sales. But after all, that's why we're in business. We need to make sales to stay in business. Whether you're making your first sale, and it seems maybe even small from a monetary standpoint, it is momentous because it is your first sale as a company. Or it could be that you've been working on putting together the perfect proposal and a bid and all of your services in a package that finally the customer has decided to buy, and it's your dream sale. Regardless, you need to be aware of what the sales process is and how to work through it in Peachtree. In this chapter, we'll talk about just that. We'll review the sales process, we'll set up sales tax in case you need to be collecting that on behalf of a taxing agency, and we'll also walk you through the process of creating things like quotes, sales orders, and invoices. At the end, you'll be all set to make those big sales or those smaller sales in order to keep your company profitable and in the green. If you are building your file along with me as I work through this course, you can simply keep that same company file open as we work. If you're just joining in, if you didn't follow all of the steps from the previous chapters, or if you simply want to start each chapter with a fresh file, you need to use a company file from the Project Files folder located on your desktop. The project files are actually backup files for my working file. They simply need to be restored in order for you to be able to use them. Go to the File menu, choose Restore, and work through the wizard to choose the backup from the file folder that you're going to be choosing from the desktop. Before we actually start creating customers and working with sales, we should lay a little bit of groundwork like we usually do in Peachtree. In order to do this, I'm actually going to go to the Customers and Sales Center, just kind of a different flow than we've been using. I've been working with menus primarily. So what this will allow us to do is to use some of the buttons, which again can be a little bit more visual, a little bit easier to find the options. If I click on the Customers button, at the very bottom I get the option to set up Customer Defaults. This is going to be very similar to what you did for vendors, but let's take a look at a couple of things specifically for setting up our customers. First of all, what is the standard term? Now you may have a special customer, but usually there's kind of a generality that goes out. For example, that everything has to be prepaid before a service is offered, for example. I'm going to say that our default is that we're going to give our client terms, and the terms are that their payment is due in 30 days. But I'm also going to give them a discount because we like to have cash in hand. So I'm going to say that if they pay within 10 days, that they'll get 3% off. I'll go ahead and enter those under discount and percent. And then I can move down to the credit limit. Now you don't have to offer a credit limit, or you can say maybe that $1,000 is the most that they can have. Let's enter 1,000. And then move down to the option for the credit status. Your options here are to say that there is no credit limit. They can charge a million dollars if they want, or if Peachtree should notify you only if they're over the limit, or if you always want to be notified of what the status is. In addition, instead of just being notified, you can say that the account should be held when it's over the limit, or you can say always hold this account. Now that would be under special circumstances. Maybe you have people who haven't paid in the past at all, so you have special situations that need to be handled. I'm going to say that I only want to be notified if they're over their limit. That way I don't have to deal with extraneous messages that really aren't important. The next thing we have, of course, are the default accounts. Now, if you're working with specific types of sales accounts, it may be difficult to know exactly what the default should be. For example, I have some clients that always do classroom training. I have some that only do CBT training. So there's a lot of different things. You may not be able to set that here. If you only have one sales account, or if one thing happens more often than the others, then you can go ahead and set these. I'm gonna leave mine as they are, and come up to the other tabs. Account aging is simple. Is it from the invoice date or the due date? We're going to age from the due date. And then you can have aging categories, which as we discussed in an earlier chapter, are generally 0 to 30, 30 to 60, 60 to 90, and over 90. We also could create some custom fields if we need to. Notice that there are some in here by default, like second contact, reference, mailing list, and multiple sites. Well, since I'm a spa, I really don't care if a company has multiple sites. But what I might care about is if that person has any allergies. So I'm going to erase multiple sites and replace it with allergies, which is a custom field that is of more interest to us in the spa business. If you don't want to use a field, you can simply remove the check mark. Now we get down to some interesting ones, and that would be the finance charges. You actually have to be very careful about finance charges. You should look at the law, maybe consult either an attorney or a business organization or an accountant to know what is legal for your particular area. 
Sometimes you can call it a finance charge and sometimes you can't. So we're going to be very careful about what we do here. The first thing is to determine if you're going to charge a finance charge. Simply check the box if you are. Then you have to determine how you're going to assess them. On invoices that are so many days overdue up to a certain amount with an annual interest rate. So let's say invoices that are more than 15 days overdue. That means if I've given somebody net 30 terms but they haven't paid in 45 days then I'm going to go ahead and add some money. Do we have a maximum amount? Let's say that the maximum we will ever charge is $20 in finance charges. The annual interest rate that you charge again is probably determined by law what the maximum can be so be careful with this. I'm going to go ahead and just choose 12 percent. Then we get some fields that say on balances above that percent and minimum finance charge. Let me kind of explain this a little bit. On balances above that do a certain percentage. Now you might want to penalize people who are actually over the minimum balance so we could charge a higher interest rate. We also could say that we want a minimum finance charge. In other words it's not worth it to my company to charge a penny or three cents. So let's go ahead and do the minimum and I'll go ahead and just say 50 cents is the minimum. Then do you want to charge interest on the finance charges? Again this is a legal issue but it means if you're charged five dollars in finance charges do you want there to be finance charges the next month if they still haven't paid on their balance plus the finance charge. You can see how that kind of rolls over and it gets very expensive very quickly. Then of course you need to choose your accounts and what should appear as on your statements. Notice we have the option of finance charge or late charge. Generally speaking late charges are okay but some places have it illegal to charge a finance charge. So while this may seem like semantics it actually could be very important. And then what about your finance charge warning? When people get an invoice and you want to let them know that they'll be charged something if they don't pay what do you want that to say? The default is overdue invoices are subject to late charges and you could put in the amount the percentage those types of things. So this is going to be set up as our default and needs to be set up very carefully depending on where you live, where you do business and what the laws are in your particular area. The last simple thing we can do here is go to pay methods. This of course is just like the other lists that we've worked with. Cash, check, Visa, MasterCard is fine. If I don't accept American Express or Discover I'll just go ahead and delete those. Remember that the one on the top is the one that becomes the default. The last thing is when you're going ahead and receiving payments and making deposits do you want to assign a deposit ticket ID in the receipts window or in select for deposit. We'll get to this when we actually start getting to payments but this is where the setting is. Let's say OK. Second thing we have to set up are sales taxes. Most states require sales tax. I happen to live in the west and I know that Oregon does not require sales tax but most states do and of course that needs to be set up. In addition many states have multiple sales taxes. In other words it could be a state tax, a city tax and then a county tax. So whatever is appropriate you're going to go through these steps for each tax that you need to assess. We're going to set up a new sales tax. You'll notice that this is kind of a wizard. You also can edit or delete or view different things. Let's just click on next. The next thing we have to do is figure out what our sales tax is composed of. Now sometimes sales tax if you're paying maybe ten and a half percent isn't all going to one agency it could be going to multiple agencies. We're going to keep our simple we're just going to pay a plain old state tax but notice that you could choose how many individual rates are making up the total rate. So you're not setting up individual rates here at this point it's the overall tax rate for your location. I'm going to choose five percent. We'll keep that for just one individual rate and then we'll go ahead and click next. Depending on how many rates you said you will get different agencies that you need to set them up for. Since I'm only doing a state that's the only one I have to do. So let's do a sales tax agency ID. I'm going to go ahead and use Oregon because Oregon doesn't normally have sales tax and that means I don't have to worry about being correct. If we use a state and it's not right we get letters from people saying that's not correct. So we'll just keep it simple. Let's go ahead and abbreviate this as OR tax. Then we'll put in the tax agency name.
and then which vendor you actually send the taxes to. Now, what does this mean? Well, if you are collecting one tax, maybe on behalf of both a state and a city, you may send it all to the city, and then the city would disperse the tax portion for the state. In our case, again, it's simple. So it's the Oregon State Tax Agency again. You then have the option to figure out how your sales taxes are created. Now, they could be just a flat rate, and that's the easiest one. In our case, we're going to say it's just 5%. But sometimes you actually have to use formulas to figure out what the rate is. That gets a little bit more complicated, and for our purposes, we'll keep it simple. And of course, that rate is going to be 5%. If I was paying 10.5%, and a little more than half of it was going to a state, and less than half was going to a county, this is where I would put in the amount for that particular entity. In other words, when I add up all of the different individual rates, it has to come up to the overall rate that I did on the prior screen. Let's go ahead and put in the account that we have to have to track our sales tax, and that's going to be 23100 which we can see is our sales tax payable. With that, let's go ahead and click Next. You shouldn't be surprised, but because we have Oregon Tax as a new vendor, we have to go ahead and set that up. Let's do that. And of course, we know that we'll normally put in a lot of different pieces of information, but for our purposes here, we want to keep it short and sweet. So we'll just do the full name and the expense account. That should do it. Let's save it and close it and get back to our wizard. And since we should now be done with this, we'll click Next. We can see that our agency has been entered, and of course we could go ahead and repeat this for multiple agencies, which would all be listed. What it's told us is that we've successfully entered the tax agencies for this particular tax. We can go ahead then and enter an ID and a name, and then do finish to get done with this entire thing. So this is the sales tax ID and the sales tax name. This is for the tax as a whole. So remember, we could have all kinds of different agencies, but this is what we want to call the tax. So the Oregon tax, or the California tax, or the Los Angeles tax, something like that. Notice again that if I try to type in Oregon tax, that I'm limited on how many characters I can have. So sometimes you have to abbreviate. And then I can make it more descriptive in the actual sales tax name. The next thing we have to do, or the last thing we have to do actually, says, do you charge sales taxes on freight? Some people do, some people don't, some places it's illegal, some places it's not. So this is something, again, that you'll need to determine for your particular company. But when you get all of this finished up, then you're ready to go ahead and click Finish. This brings us back to the first screen of the wizard, and we can continue to set up new sales taxes or work with them as we need to. I'm going to go ahead and be done with this one by clicking Cancel. Now we've been able to set up our defaults for our customers as well as our sales tax, and that means we're ready to go ahead and work with the customers and the sales themselves.